Hello again, I'm Julian Bickerstedt, the President of IIC, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the Forbes Prize Lecture. The Forbes Prize was established in 1958 to honour Edward Waldo Forbes, Director Emeritus of the Fogg Art Museum, Harvard University, and IIC's first honorary fellow. You need go no further than the latest edition of IIC's News in Conservation and the article on the Harvard Art Museum's Forbes Pigment Collection to understand how important Forbes was to establishing conservation science as a discipline. The Forbes Prize is awarded by the IIC Council to a person who has made an outstanding contribution to the field of conservation. The Forbes Prize winner is invited to deliver a lecture at the IIC Congress. The first one was given by Harold Plenderleaf in Rome in 1961. I'm delighted to introduce Dr Norman Tennant as the Forbes Prize winner and lecturer for 2020. The formal piece is that Norman earned a PhD in chemistry from the University of Glasgow in 1974 and was a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Chemistry at Ohio State University in the States. As a conservation scientist, he's conducted research in museums and conservation, served as a freelance consultant, and taught conservation courses at universities in the United Kingdom, Europe, and the United States. He's currently Professor of Natural Scientific Aspects of the Conservation and Restoration of Cultural Heritage at the University of Amsterdam. The informal piece is that I was lucky enough to spend a couple of days with Norman in Beijing last year. I learnt that he knows his Scottish country houses, having run custom tours around them in his younger days. I learnt he's sung with the Scottish National Orchestra in Carnegie Hall in New York, and that he invented Finbond, the non-yellowing epoxy used in glass conservation. I can also tell you that he's built his illustrious career using his superlative reasoning and deductive powers to find creative solutions to the benefit of our conservation profession. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Norman to lecture on spanning the decades, personalities, perspectives and priorities in conservation science. It is a real honor and privilege to be invited to deliver the IIC's 2020 Forbes Prize Lecture. Alas, not in the congenial and sociable surroundings of the planned venue in Edinburgh, but in compensation, the lecture is being recorded in the magnificent surroundings of Brodick Castle on the island of Arran in the west of Scotland. Brodick Castle is one of the historic properties of the National Trust for Scotland, who have graciously made it available, and especially the drawing room in which we stand, for the filming. Were we all together in person in Edinburgh, we would be close to the wonderful cantilever rail bridge which spans the River Forth, and has done so for 12 decades. My lecture will introduce five personalities, conservation scientists whose research has spanned, in comparison with the rail bridge, a mere nine decades. Through their research, and that of myself over a few four and a half decades, I hope to develop a number of research themes which give a perspective and point to some priorities in conservation science, which I believe are important and, dare I say, in some cases, undervalued. I hope that the piano music, 
which heralded my arrival at the lectern, did not seem too pretentious. It was composed by Rossini, and in fact named by him his pretentious prelude, but a light-hearted tribute to J.S. Bach, whom he greatly admired. The relevance to my lecture, and in particular to my personalities and to myself, is that Rossini's pretentious prelude is one of what he himself called his sins of old age, some 150 small pieces which he wrote 30 years after his retirement and after the composition of his last opera, William Tell. We will find that my chosen personalities all continued with conservation science after retirement, and we hope that that was not in the form of their sins of old age. As with the light-hearted tone of Rossini's final sins of old age, my lecture is intended to be a very personal and light-hearted take on the contribution of five inspirational scientists during my own journey in the subject. It will not be thorough and comprehensive, certainly not in comparison with many fine studies of the subject carried out in recent years. Notable amongst those is a study in Britain by the House of Lords who investigated the whole point and subject of science and heritage. A subsequent meeting in the UK also delved into this theme. And then more recently, a superb and very comprehensive overview of the subject was undertaken by ICROM in a meeting which was subsequently published in many volumes by the IIC itself. The lecture, as I say, will cover several themes of conservation science. Here they are listed and we will come to them in later parts of the lecture. Serendipity, the development of personal specialisms, the need also for an institutional memory, and especially the need for hypothesis-driven research. An aspect of research, namely the development part of research and development, needs also to be addressed. And the experimental results for environment interactions with material. Finally, and not least, weaving its way through the lecture, will be the need for progress in instrumental and data processing. But first we should consider, perhaps, a definition of conservation science. There have been many, and this again is a personal take on what would be a reasonable definition. I take the attitude that conservation science is the application of any branch of the natural sciences with the direct and the emphasis on the direct motivation to improve the conservation of cultural heritage. As such, you will see that this definition excludes archaeometry, excludes technical art history, and is a more defined subset of the general term which is now in common use, heritage science. This will be elaborated upon in the, in the lecture, especially when it is connected to the personalities who have concerned themselves with aspects of this definition of conservation science, as well as with other aspects of the subject, namely, as I say, archaeometry and technical art history. That brings me nicely to Madame Caroline Testu, a rose, a rose which is known widely throughout the world, especially in the city of Portland, Oregon, where millions were planted in the early days of the rose's appearance in the world. It's a rose that has a beautiful pink, velvety texture, which looked down on me as I prepared this lecture over the recent weeks in the summer at home in Scotland. But who was Madame Caroline Testu? Her rose is known but nothing about her personality or her business or her life, apart from very few observations. Indeed, she was a French couturier and she had fashionable salons in London and in Paris. She traveled regularly to Lyon and that's relevant because she commissioned a rose breeder there to name a pink rose after her and she introduced it, Madame Caroline Testu, 
arose the better name at her salons in 1890. And voila! So she is commemorated by her name in her rose for posterity, known by thousands, nay tens of thousands of rose growers worldwide, who would not know anything of her were it not for her rose. So it is that we all have the risk of being forgotten. Scientists, conservation scientists, and all of us. Unless we make our mark in some peculiar way. The personalities that I will deal with are five in number, as I say. Here they are. We will meet them throughout the lecture and we will learn more of their research. Robert Bill, Patrick Ritchie, Robert Feller, René Van Tessel and Robert Organ. And the point is, some of these names will be familiar to you, others not at all. Like Madame Caroline Testu, their recollection and their impact is in specific ways. And those who know their research, if not their personality and their activities and their life, then they will remember their impact. And that will become clear that we, as conservation scientists, are remembered by our publications, by our interaction with other scientists, and by, especially, the influence that we have on students and those that follow after. And so we move to Robert Bill, an active scientist throughout his whole career, as we can see, in the Corning Museum of Glass. He began and continued his whole active career in cultural heritage in that one museum until his retirement in 2008, and even then continued to be active, as we said, into his period of sins of old age, perhaps. His publication of the last of a series of three volumes came in 2012, and it represents the culmination of a career where I wish to stress the first theme, the importance of the prolonged personal and institutional development of expertise on certain subjects. A difficult conundrum to solve because sometimes the institutional memory is very much bound up with individual scientists. When they leave, with them goes that institutional memory. It is embodied in their activities, it is present in their publications, but the danger is that in conservation research, where conservation scientists are not numerous, then the passage of scientists from activity into inactivity can leave a gap in the knowledge of that institution. And alas, as with the vagaries of modern day life and modern day financing, sometimes even a gap in the provision of conservation science. Some of the museums I mention, Corning Museum of Glass, is faced with the difficulty of maintaining the scientist's input into conservation science. The activity of Robert Brill himself is well represented in this slide, where all the various projects that he practiced, that he implemented, that he researched, that he published on, that he didn't publish on, but kept a research documentation, they are all maintained in the storage facility of the Corning Museum of Glass. Here they are, numerous as you can see, a wonderful heritage, a wonderful heritage bound up also with the knowledge that he carried there too and carries still in his own experience. This is important because without that knowledge and without the three volumes of publication, we would be unaware of much of the research that has been carried out over these many years, a lifetime of research in one institution on one subject.